and uh, thank you for inviting me and to give the opportunity to talk about this, about what makes individuals different uh, facing infection. So in general, when you are sick, in many cases, we are going to, we tell you, you believe that you have a given disease and your, your practitioner will tell you, oh, you have like gastroenteritis and you believe that you know what it is. But the real, because we have idea of COVID or salmonella infection or different infection, flu. But in general, when, even when you have the flu, it's just a statistic. We actually don't really know what you have. It's more like because it's a flu season, you have symptoms of the flu, and then you actually believe you are told that you are flu. But in reality, we don't really know what is a gastroenteritis. And we don't really know what are the infections that we have, and, but we know that they are very diverse. And so far, we mainly, very often, treat disease as a, as a whole rather than really specific. Um, type of infection. And the story is even worse when you actually think that a person, a patient, is not like this, is actually more like that. So more than having all the diversity of the disease we have, and we try to treat disease, but what we should try to do is to treat people rather than disease as a whole. Because people are much likely to respond differently to different treatments, and also to different infections. So today, I hope to give you some insight and some uh, thinking about what are, uh, why are some individuals surviving when others die from the infection, knowing that when I say surviving, it, can, it doesn't need to be really the survival. It can be just having more or less um, uh, cryptic, or more or less uh, uh, severe symptoms. So in other uh, words, where does the intraspecies variation come from? So I didn't wait for COVID uh, to be interested for this question, even though now it's really a, um, of a, a big topic, but it comes from when I was working uh, with Daphnia, because Daphnia, interestingly, are clonal, which means that all the progeny are genetically identical to their mother. And we have infections that we can do, like for example, here for, for, with Pasteria aromosa, where we also have a clone of the parasites. And so when you con con control for the genetic of both and of the environment, what you notice here with this survival growth where you see the percentage of surviving over time, then you see that some individuals die at 30 days while others die at 70 days. So why, even if you actually control for everything, some individuals die very early while others don't. So working with human is uh, very complicated and working with Daphnia had this a lot of limits. So that's why I worked then in Cornell to work on Drosophila uh, melanogaster. And luckily enough, they are also not equal when facing diseases. So what we can do with, uh, with Drosophila is, as, as I'm showing here, we can infect by injecting in the abdomen a suspension of bacteria, the same way that what would happen if they will be bitten by an ectoparasite, like here the mice, in the in their abdomen. So we try to have a, a fairly natural way to infect them systematic, systemically with a generally low dose of bacteria. And so the, the chance with Drosophila is that we can replicate a lot of the disease categories that are known. For example, here with those species, we can have cases where you have no uh, death at all upon infection, in those last cases, you would have a benign infection. In other cases, you would have a, all your population that crashes, they all die from the infection very quickly. Those are severe infections. On the other end here, you see that you can have part of the population that dies and other that will survive. In this case, here, especially uh, in this case, we say that they are chronic, and one of the chronic infections that we are going to be very much interested in this talk is the one with Providencia regular. So in these uh, two cases where you have benign infection and chronic infection, you, one thing is really interesting to notice is that in most cases, you have still bacteria after seven days of clearance. So they're not benign or chronic because, don't, at least they're not benign because they clear. I would like you to call your attention on this graph, which because I will be using this graph quite often. 
here in the y-axis, so this is the most important in that case, that you have the bacteria per fly. So each dot is one individual. And this is in log two. And the rationale of using the log two, log two is because each unit means one bacterial division. As a, as a reference, log two of 10 is about 1,000 bacteria and uh, of 18 is about 260,000 bacteria. Like this, you have an idea of the range of bacteria and quickly it can reach million. So the other chance with the Drosophila that we have is that we can work with uh, host genotypes by working with isolines. So we inbred a lot to our population and by crossing brothers and sisters. And we, what we found and what we have is different genotypes and we have variation. So we have the effect of the genotype on survival. Here you see that we're infected with pyrogari and different level or proportion of hosts of, that survive for given genotypes. You also have something that's very common in nature is a difference between sex. Here we worked on the heartbreak population Drosophila and we see that in this, in this, in this instance, males are more resist, more uh, dying less than females. Also in Drosophila, you are, or they are what they eat. So if you expose them to infection, when they are fed, um, with a high, a high sugar diet or low sugar diet, you see that for a given uh, genotype of you know, the females, you see that the, the females are dying more on high diet sugar than on low. But this also depends on the genotype. So you have sometimes where they die more on the, on the high sugar diet, sometimes there is no effect of the treatment, another time you have the opposite. So I would like to call you again the attention on this type of graph. So here you have three different survival graphs. Each survival graph can actually be summarized with what we call the log of the hazard ratio, which is here. So this graph can be summarized with this. The advantage of this is that you can easily compare different genotypes like here. When the uh, confidence interval here is going above or um, overlap over the zero, that means that there is no effect of the treatment. When they are below in this case, means that they die more on, low, on high um, glucose diet. And when they are here, they die, they die more on low um, glucose diet. So what you can see here is that indeed, you have an effect of the genotype on the way they respond to infection according to what they ate. But also, what is very interesting is that if you keep the same ranking, you see that this ranking change with males, with the sex. So on the other hand, what you can find is that you have an interaction between genetics, sex, and environment all together mingled together to give you a chance of, of um, surviving the infection. There is another aspect, which is age, but even though it's really important, and we have seen that with COVID again, to cite COVID uh, uh, for the last time, um, to, um, that is key, but I'm not working on it. So I won't be able to present you everything I have done on this topic uh, for an obvious reason of time, but I would like to give you a, a little overview just to give you some words on how this could also happen. So I have worked with Daphnia and Daphnia uh, they are crustacean and crustacean molds all the time. And so I was interested to look as so we found that unpredicted environment for the parasite, which is here, unpredicted molting, prevented the host to be infected. So if they had a bacteria on their, on, on their carapace, and that it happens that they will molt at this time, then they will be getting rid of the parasite, they will not be infected. We also worked on the role of predators, so how the predators could uh, eat more or less uh, individuals that are infected. And so infected individual could die uh, faster from infection because actually eaten. The impact, we worked also on the impact of your community. So is it uh, important to be alone in your hospital when you're sick or does being with other uh, diseased people affect your chance to, um, to have very severe symptoms? And today I would talk about the small variation that you have in your daily life. I mean, this is the way of anthropomorphizing it, but how the small variation can drastically influence the symptoms of the infection. 
then I would go on the predicted environments, with meaning in that case is how the development, uh, the, the environment during your development can influence your immune system. Then something I would not present, but yet very important is the role of genetics. And more precisely is like, if you are the most common genotype, you are likely that the parasite will be adapted to you. This is the type of frequency dependent um, effect of frequency dependent effects of the parasite. And what I would like to note here is that very often we, we speak about it very largely it being the genotype. But what we found is that this could also happen at a very specific gene interacting with the parasite at a very specific step of the infection. Today, I won't present this, but I will present more on something like how parasite mutation during infection would also change the chance of surviving. So this is fairly random genetic uh, changes. And I will briefly speak about the role of sex in the immunity, but I won't talk about uh, the role of the, of the parasite adaptation to those difference between sex and how this could influence the behavior of the parasite in each sex and changing the chances to survive to the infection. So when you have a graph like that of surviving, so meaning that when you have uh, individuals that survive and others that don't, you want to go further. You want to know why, what's happened during the, the infection process to explain um, uh, this uh, difference. So here, I will call that the within host dynamic, which is the growth, prolif the proliferation of the pathogen in the host. And often I will shorten it by uh, calling it WHD. So how this within host dynamic can be a source of variation in the survival here of Drosophila. So the problem with Drosophila, like in many small animals, that to estimate the bacterial load in a fly, you need to grind the, uh, the host, which means that how can we get, how can we quantify the within host dynamic in small animals if you can't actually have a series of, um, of sampling in the same animal? So the way we, aborted, we, we looked at this was by, by infecting a large population of flies at the same time with a very controlled um, um, dose, or so by injecting. And what we did is that by look, we looked at every hour, we estimated at every hour, the, the bacterial load in different individuals. So here each dot is one individual from the original population, and then over time, what's happening. And what you see is that over time, you have an increase in variance in your population of flies, and you, that hence, with some individuals that are very high load, probably those that are overwhelmed by, by the infection and those that are, have control of the infection. So you also have a binary outcome in the within host dynamic. And so then how can you now explain that you have this binary outcome on infection as much as in the survival, but also in the within host dynamic. And I would like to call you the attention that your attention that you could ask this question with contrasted conditions, but here we even look at the, the, the cases where we control the, for the genetics and for the environment. So how to characterize the within host dynamic in Drosophila? So we wanted to first go in the simplest way where we will have likely no control of the bacteria. So that you would not, you will only have uh, the bacteria growing uh, in, in the host without any uh, noise from the host um, immune system. And for this, thanks to Drosophila, so here is the pathway IND, which is an important pathway to control our bacteria. It doesn't matter all those names. What you need to know is that when you inject, uh, when you infect with the bacteria that we are using, you have a cascade of gene to leading to the expression of AMB, antimicrobial peptide, and which are going to kill the bacteria. So we have a mutant within this pathway preventing from the expression of the AMP. And when you do that, so meaning that you're using immune deficient hosts, what you see is that the bacteria, the, 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 the variance of the hosts over time does not increase. So indeed what you see is more like 
the same thing that you would see in vitro. And indeed, it's what we use. So what we want to do now is to characterize the wheel and host dynamic by putting different parameters on, on these curves. So the same way that a, a, a line can be, a, line, a regression line can explain the hours to the number of bacteria, which if it was a line, you could just say it's a y equal ax plus b. We all know this from, from high school. And so, and so what we can do here is just have a more complicated um, equation that describes this line, right? And instead of having A and B, we have uh, names that we, for us makes more sense, like the lag or, or the, the growth. And, and we try to find the best parameters. So we say we optimize the model. So we try to find the best parameters to fit the dots that we see here to explain the correlation between those two variables, right? And so thanks to this, by optimizing this, we can get values like indeed the growth rate, for example. But in our uh, case, we have also the immune system. Some individuals are able to, to, to control, right? So to do that and to uh, try to characterize what's going on in those individuals, we add another um, equation separate to this one. So in that case, we then have two equations and the probability to be in one equation on the other, which will be um, given by the intensity of the red here, meaning that more you are red, less you are likely to belong to the, to the population that didn't control the infection. So this is, this. I try to just have a simple way for, for, to see the most important part is that we try to fit the best, the best that we can at the same time, the two growth and the degrowth at the same time, and to get the parameters and which parameters we have. So here what we have, we have at the beginning, we know the inoculum. The idea is that the bacteria is going to grow until the death of the host. And at various times, you would have different hosts that would control the infection. Thanks to our model, we will be able uh, notably to have uh, the estimation of a lag of the average time to control the infection, the growth rate, the control rate, and the probability to control the infection. I would like you to see that this is a bit a shortcut for the presentation. I'm not saying here that I have a bacterial load for the probability to control. I am saying this is a number of individuals that are here. So here you will have five over all the individuals that we have at the beginning. So it's a probability to be here, not a bacterial load. So it's probability to have control. It's a proportion. So, but a model can always give you parameters. You feed them, you have an equation, you will always have uh, uh, an, uh, an outcome. So we wanted to know how accurate is our model. For that, we actually did what we call then trajectory. So what I call trajectory is this, is looking at different, uh, over time, the, the, the bacterial load in the different hosts. And you can do that with disease that where all the flies survive. And what you can see is that you don't have the, 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 the dichotomy here. So all the hosts control. You can also do that with flies that don't survive. So these are actually the same. So you, you see that all, none of them goes down. You can do that with flies where in infection where some flies survive and other don't. So here again, so you have an increase in the, in the, in the population of hosts. And you can flip the model to optimize the different parameters and the estimate the different parameters that you would have with your cloud of dots. So you can do that also with the same infection and different uh, genotypes to compare different genotypes like we have here. So here now we have nine different infections where we can estimate, for example, here, the average time to control. So this each dot is our estimation with uh, a confidence interval. So first we wanted to know if this TC was indeed linked to the immune system. And what we did is that we, we use with flies, we could induce genetically the IMD system, so the immune system, before we expose, expose the host to the bacteria. And what we found is about inducing the, 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 so reducing the delay of the immune response, we see that the control is instantaneous. So what you see here then, that the, the TC is indeed uh, uh, linked to the immune system. So taking this idea, we took, for example, here, one of the infections that do not kill, and we exposed them 
to hosts that are uh, not um, that that don't that are immunodeficient. And in that case, you see that this bacteria is going to grow without any control. Now, the way to estimate how when uh, is the control happening, we use we compare these growth to the control lines. So the, those ones are control are not immunodeficient. And at the time where you see a discrepancy between both is that the, at this moment, in this interval, you had a, the host that were able to control the infection, right? And so what you can see here is that the, this control occur between two and four hours. And indeed here, as you can see here, it's actually what our um, model was predicting. And you can do that now for another infection, PYKRI, and even if it's growth here, it actually makes sense. And we know now more and more than it's indeed, in this case, around eight. You can do that with also, we did that before then with gram negative, which are controlled by IND pathway, but we can also do it with the uh, with gram positive bacteria, which are uh, controlled by other type, mainly by other pathway, but then it's just need this in Drosophila, it's easy to get immunodeficient for the given pathway. And you see again, that it fits very properly. So TC seems to be well estimated by our um, uh, model. Now, what about the probability to control? So the proportion, the probability to control can estimate, it can be estimated uh, empirically by, by this, right? It's a survival curve and you know how many individual have been surviving in the different uh, experiments. And when you compare to what our model web was able to predict, you have a very nice correlation between the, our, our prediction and uh, empirical data. So now that we know our model is actually uh, quite good at predict, predicting, we want to know what are the parameters that are important to explain this correlation. So in the other way, it's like in no, any model that you do, you actually remove the parameters and you, you test, does this parameter improve the likelihood of my model? And in that case, what you see is that when you actually take all the parameters, all the infections together, what explains the best, what helps the best to predict the proportion of surviving is actually the growth of the bacteria. However, when you're more sensitive and you actually look at only the one that are chronic, where you have some that die and some that survive, you see that the, what makes you to survive the most is your probability, your speed of control. So it's the time to control as is a key for surviving the infection and to be chronic. So I hope that here I will um, uh, convince you that uh, first, so the time to control at the beginning of the infection is really key to, uh, to resist. So for the final outcome, so the few hours, and that even this is affected by very small variation. Like in human words, it would be like if you have been uh, um, eating badly lately, if you have been um, uh, cold, all those little things that you can't really control on a daily basis. Here is probably what happened with, with the Drosophila, where we try to control as much uh, uh, the big things that we usually control, and still we have a huge difference uh, due to the small difference in, in the, in the um, so we have a huge difference in infection outcome due to the small differences in the time to control. So now I'm going to talk about the uh, developmental um, environment and how it can play. It can play on uh, the immune system later in life. This is being done by um, a PhD student, Yara Rodriguez, who is co-directed by uh, Patricia Verdad at the University of uh, Lisbon. So in this model is Bicyclis, Bicyclis aminano. It's uh, beautiful butterflies that has two morphs. So it means that for the same genotype, depending on the condition uh, during development, they are going to have different morphs. So here with very cryptic uh, morphs and a very nice butterfly system um, with eyes. So the life cycle of these um, butterflies is very interesting for our question because, so eggs are laid in November and then you have a wet season where the, 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 the butterflies are going to develop. And the important part here is that during this season, 
you have two generations of butterflies. So actually here, it's really the, the moment where they need to invest a lot in the, in the reproduction and leave, they don't leave that long. However, so then they lay here at the end of the season and the one that developed at the beginning of the dry season needs to wait for six months to, to actually be able to lay again and continue the cycle. So here you have a morph where you need to invest in reproduction very fast. And here you have a morph where you have to wait six months before laying. And I would like to point out here that this is very clear for females. It is a bit less clear for males. We don't really know if males are um, um, fertilizing the females at the beginning of the season, at the end. It is more likely, uh, we see it goes with our result, that they will be fertilizing at the beginning. And then here, they will be surviving, but evolutionary, evolutionary speaking, it's less important to survive. So if their phenotypic plasticity then for the immune system, meaning that here, because they live longer, we expect that they will invest more in the immune system because they need to survive to all the parasites they are going to have. To do so, so Yara collected eggs from a same cohort and then exposed them to either 19 degrees or 27 degrees. Then she acclimated them in the cage and inject them, injected them either with PBS or with provident, uh, Pseudomonas entomophila. I need to, do, and I want to point out that there is really, I mean, I think no work on these uh, butterflies and immunity. And she found out that this uh, pathogen is actually fairly good to study immunity in this uh, model. Then she kept all the adults in the intermediate uh, temperature and we could see the survival uh, over time. And what you can see here is that, so here's a proportion of survival over days, over 17 days. And let's have a look directly to the summary, to the summary of, of this survival. So this is, as I showed you before, I told you before, this is a summary of what you see here. Here, what's important to see is that the PBS control don't die. So indeed, what you see here is first that males die more than females to the infection. And males are, doesn't seem to be very plastic, while females uh, do like we expected. The one with dry season, so the one that needs to live longer, indeed were dying less than the one that's from the wet season. So it seems that there is a sexual dimorphism in these butterflies, but also that there is a plasticity in survival. And now, why do they die differently? So I hope you understood that every time that we have that survival difference in survival, what we want to understand is how in the within host dynamic, we can explain the differences in survival. So Yara did this huge work by, by in, looking like I did with flies, looking over time the bacterial load, they did three independent uh, replicates and she did that for in, so the wet, so the dry morph, the wet morph for the males, and in that case she could get the different parameters of the of the of the within host dynamics, such as the lag, the growth, and the Nmax, which is here the value of the maximum of, um, bacteria they have during chronicity, and which is and she did that also for females, and so you can then extract the values that the model uh, estimates and correlate it to the log hazard ratio, so to the survival. And what we see is that the lag is not correlating to the, um, to the hazard ratio. So with our data, and we acknowledge that we don't have too many data points, but each point is actually a lot of work. So in that case, we could not show that there is a, um, that there is a correlation. We could not show either that there is a correlation with the Nmax. However, she nicely showed that uh, there is a correlation between the max growth rate. So the growth, the growth of, the, of the bacteria explain here very nicely the difference in survival. And so we wanted also to understand what's the role in tolerance in the difference in survival. So tolerance is uh, the fault of the resistance. Resistance is to control the bacteria. Tolerance is how you can deal with infection. And we uh, met up, uh, we, we proposed a new way of uh, characterizing tolerance by using this blood. 
the blood, which stands for bacterial load upon death, is the maximum bacteria load that a host can sustain before it dies. So basically, we look at the bacteria, the number of bacteria in the 30 minutes um, within the, the death of, of the host. And I'll take a, a minute to, to introduce more the blood by uh, talking about our results with Providence red dry in Drosophila, just to illustrate really what it is. And so here, what you can see is a number of bacteria per fly, either when they are alive, and here is when they are dead. So we pulled all the, the data we had actually. And what you can see is that the blood is actually really um, represented in alive bacteria. So it's very an indication of the dead bacteria. Very importantly, the blood does not correlate with how long it takes to die. So here are two different fly genotypes. Say, and we have um, looked at the time of death post uh, injection. So when they died, and there is no correlation if they died after two days or within a day with the blood. This is important because now it just means that you can actually come the next day after infection and take all the, the points in within the day and have a, um, an idea of what the blood for the given genotype. Also, the blood is importantly not affected by the initial dose. So you can also increase a little bit the dose. And so, so these are just a, a OD of different bacterial loads. It doesn't matter actually the, the, the number. What you see that there is no effect of the load. So if you increase the load here of the bacteria, you increase the survival, you decrease the survival, like, like trivially expected. But when you look at the blood, there is no effect. So and finally, what you, if you compare um, here like host genotypes, you can have the blood that is higher in some individual than in other um, uh, genotypes. Sorry. And in that case, you can say that this, and this genotype are probably more tolerant. So it's a form of tolerance. I'm not saying that blood represents a whole tolerance, but it's a form of tolerance. So the, those uh, genotypes are more tolerant than those genotypes. And so now that you know what the blood is, uh, we did that with uh, butterflies. And we found that the blood is indeed different between morph. And, and this is true for both sexes. However, it doesn't go uh, together with the, the, like the, the survival. So females that were surviving more actually seems to be less tolerant than, than the other. So the blood is different, but it's not the tolerance that can explain the difference in survival. So now here I addressed the part of our environment. Now I would like to uh, call your attention of what's happening during the, uh, the infection for the parasite. So I will be looking at the mutation of the pathogen. So for this, I uh, studied a bacteria that is called Xenoibus pneumatophila, which is a bacteria, it's a very fascinating uh, system where the bacteria are uh, in the nematode. The nematode infect uh, uh, insect larvae, like uh, in uh, larvae from uh, Lepidopteran or, or, or Coleoptera. The nematodes punch the intestinal wall and inject the bacteria in the host. The bacteria are very virulent and it's going to kill the host. And then the uh, vector is going to reproduce, proliferate in the dead animal to go again, reassociate with the bacteria and continue the cycle. But what is interesting is that they kill very quickly this, those insects, but they stay for several, for many days in the dead insect. And what is was known is that you have some mutation that naturally occur in a gene that's called LRP, so leucine responsive receptor protein, which is a master regulator. So it affects a lot of phenotypes in the bacteria, uh, including, for example, the, the filament. And, uh, and here, what we have is we have several uh, mutants, which is the numbers here, are actually mutants with only one mutation in the gene. And so now what we want to know is what are the consequences of the mutation that occur during this infection on the pathogen virulence. So we use this as a model. So we, we actually uh, um, got those naturally occurring uh, uh, bacteria from the system, but we use that with Drosophila 
because we could control way more with Drosophila and UC1. And what we see is that in Drosophila, the, the non mutants in blue are more virulent than the mutant bacteria. And the bacteria that are mutants, as you can see again here to summarize this, this effect, but here to see for all the different strains, so all, those are all the different strains that we have, the strains that have a missense uh, uh, mutation are actually more virulent than the one of non-sense. So the, the type of mutation also changed the virulence. So now we wanted to understand the role of the within host dynamic is in, in this change of virulence. So here, what I would like you to pay attention is that we didn't do the full growth. We only took, because we know that anyway they are going to die, so they are not controlled in this case, in, in, in neither in the, in the mutant nor in the wild type. So we just took the time zero here and the type eight hours post-infection here. And we did that in several replicated experiments and we can, then estimate the difference between zero and eight and have, a, have a, a, a proxy of the growth within the host. In this case, we have a healthy host where we have bacteria that are non-mutant bacteria. And here we have mutant bacteria and we can compare. So taking into account the effect of the, of the, of the experiment, we can get an estimation for here the dot that is extracted from the model. It's an estimate from the model that could, um, then we, we know that here, the early growth in healthy, you see here, is actually higher in non-mutant, in wild type, than in mutant bacteria. So the mutant bacteria grow less well in healthy uh, host. And this is actually a bit what you see here is that the growth is lower. Now, another thing you can also ask is how sensitive are they to the immune system? And what you can do for that is you can compare in immuno, immunodeficient flies the capacity to, to, uh, to grow. So here again, we did the same. This is in immuno, immunodeficient fly if we look at the wild type bacteria and the other one in um, uh, the mutant bacteria. And what you can see is that you can correlate both. And if the bacteria do not care about the immune system, you will see that they will be following this line and therefore they will be grow, meaning that they are growing the same way in healthy fly and in immunodeficient fly. And what you can see here is that the mutant um, bacteria, the one actually very, the, the nonsense um, mutation trigger a sensitivity to the, immunos, in, to the immune system because you can see they grow better in immunodeficient flies than they do in healthy fly. But as I told you, I want you also to know if this within host dynamic could explain the other ratio. And for this, what we do is something we do now very regularly. We compare the early growth in the healthy flies, so in wild type flies, and uh, to, the, uh, to the hazard ratio we observed. And what we find is that we have a nice correlation between the early growth dynamic and the hazard ratio. So now, what about the pathogenicity? And I would like to call your attention here that we, to, to test the pathogenicity, we looked at the blood. So we see again, the bacterial load upon death. And what we find is that, oh no, and the rational here is that before I was telling you that the blood is a difference between, uh, of tolerance. But here we have only one host genotype, right? So if you do that, you don't expect any difference in, in um, intolerance, what you expect is a difference in the damage that the bacteria could do to this uh, single genotype. And difference in blood would, would explain difference in damages that is uh, provided by the different strains. And what we did then, so again, we can, as usual, uh, uh, get this taking into account experimental uh, design using, we can have an estimate of the bacteria uh, per dead host for each of the strains. And what you can see that actually there, are, there is no difference, as we see here, there are no difference between uh, blood and this doesn't correlate with the hazard ratio. So the, the, the survival is then, the difference in survival was not explained by a difference in bacterial pathogenicity, only growth. But I would like to call your attention that 
what we know in the, in the model is that those mutations occur in the dead host. So what we wanted to do here is to take the opportunity of this change in environment, which is another step of the infection, evolution during this step of infection, which is the death of the host, and see if the mutation provides an advantage during the step of the infection. And what we did is we looked at the bacterial uh, load at death and the bacterial load at death plus 24 hours. So how much did they grow? Or how much did the wild type bacteria and how much the mutant bacteria have grown during the 24 hours post death? So I would like to recall here that these are not different uh, bacterial lines, but just different experimental records. And what we found, again, to summarize with the estimate of our model, we find that the one that have uh, the mutation grow better in the dead host than the one that are wild type. And interestingly, then what we found is that if you correlate the capacity to do early growth in the host and the capacity to grow in the dead host, you see that there is a trade between the capacity, to, the ability to grow within the host so when you have the mutation, you now can grow in the dead host, but you, you lose the capacity to, to grow with the immune system or in the early growth. And when you actually, before you had the capacity to grow in the, in the healthy host, you, you are not able as well to grow in the dead host. So here, I hope that with this model, so I'm aware that it's not, so I'm not looking in exactly in the, in the same infection. So we have been taking infection that occur uh, before, but I'm, I'm, I'm before in another system. But uh, just to see that those mutations that occur during the, the infection could happen even in our cases for human, for example, where you have a progression of an, of an infection and an evolution of the bacteria in those. So and quickly, um, I would like to speak about sexual dimorphism in immunity. So um, I want to talk about this in, in, in any way quickly because we realize that um, the sex is really something that is not very often taken into account in um, many biological studies. And this is very scary because if you look at here, the percent of the study including both sexes in pharmacology or immunology or neuroscience, or even physiology, you have very little cases where you have both. And, and this you could think, okay, maybe because it's uh, difficult with mice or because it's very costly. But we recently um, reviewed the immunity of Drosophila and so that it's actually, even when you have no more cost of using both sexes, they are there. It's very rare that uh, we use both, both sexes. So I would like here to show you how sexual dimorphism actually can be a very large source of, um, of uh, uh, variation in the infection outcome. So what we found in this, uh, with this bacteria, Pogodensia regeri, is that in many cases, at least in our cases, we have males that survive better than females. And so we wanted also to understand why, like usual, why they die differently. And what we found is that there is a big difference, I mean, there is an important difference in sexual dimorphism in the time to control. And actually, I, I must say, it's not a big difference. It's an important difference. And this is really important to, to pay attention to. On average, the, 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 in females, will be about 13, 13 hours, while in males, it's 18 hours. And this is very characteristic and important to take into account. Is because we are in, in, a, in bacteria grow logistically, but there is an exponential phase of it where, where very quickly you can reach very high numbers. The difference in eight hours and 13 hours is probably huge in terms of number, number of bacteria uh, in the host. So here, very little difference in time to control explain a big difference in host. And I would like just to go back to here. This is a difference in 30%. And very often people will say, oh, but 30% is not really large. Well, in our days, you should actually look at the data we have for, for the recent uh, um, pandemics and you will see if 30% is not large. So 
Now we also wanted to know the difference in tolerance, taking blood um, as a measure of the tolerance, and we find that there is no difference in blood in this case between male and female. So I'm, I don't think that it's generally the case. Here we have two different genotypes and there are no differences. Pretty sure that we could find the genotype where there are where 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 there are differences. However, in that case, we were not explaining the difference in survival. And so one thing that I also uh, like to go and to go through is to understand the mechanism behind those uh, the difference in the outcome of infection and here for sexual dimorphism. So what I first did is doing a transcriptum analysis. So we did an RNA-seq where we compared at eight hours post-injection the response between males and females. And what we find very characteristically is that one thing that was very different between male and female was the expression of this antimicrobial peptide from the tall pathway. So tall pathway, again, is a tall, it's a pathway that is uh, an immune branch of immunity that leads to the expression of those antimicrobial peptides. And what we found is that, so here, what you need to see in, the, in, in, this, um, in this pathway is that the tall pathway is important to respond to gram-positive bacteria and fungi, but we also know that it's important, it can respond to the gram-negative like Providencia regulari through the damages that the bacteria can, can uh, give to the host. And so what we did first is to say, okay, what is the role of the tall pathway in this dimorphism? For this, we, we had a mutant very low, very down in the pathway to completely stop the pathway very low here. And what we see that we lose the, the sexual dimorphism when we do so. So the tall pathway is indeed important for the, for the dimorphism. But we wanted to go farther and test if the difference between those two branches. So here I told you, you have the branch here, the Persephone branch that responds to the damages. And you have here the, the, the mod SP, we call the mod SP branch that's responded to the, to the role of the pathogens. And what we see is that if we remove mod SP, allowing Persephone, we reduce the immune, the, the, the dimorphism, but it's still present. However, if we remove Persephone, then we absolutely abolish the dimorphism. So Persephone branch of the tall pathway was responsible for the sexual dimorphism. So to conclude, I hope that here I convinced you the, the, of the importance of looking at both sexes. And here in that case, we see that the difference was due to a difference in immune recognition, leading to a difference of few hours in control. And, but I won't talk about um, the consequences of this dimorphism on the pathogen evolution, but I want just to say words that, okay, uh, pathogens can also adapt specifically to the host if they are more exposed to the males, for example, that would be adapting eventually to the males, and then they will behave differently depending on the host that they are adapted to. So if they are well adapted to males, when they will uh, 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 encounter females, they will most probably behave differently. So here I would like to sum up my, my talk by giving you uh, the idea that what makes some individuals die from infection while others don't? Well, some uh, parts come from, as you just said, the difference between sexes. So being male and female, it's key. And it should actually not even be a question anymore. It should just be something that we have in all our experiments. Also the small variation that we do, do in a daily life. And I'm pretty sure that in, in, in our society, the way we, we wake up, the way we eat, all those things can have drastic impact at the end of our infection. The environment during the development is most probably important as well, and the mutation that can occur during the infection. So again, the the, 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 all the interaction between genetics, sex, and environment are key to understand what makes an individual to die or survive, and the interact, all those interactions with age will be key to understand really uh, disease outcomes. With this, I would like to thank Brian Lazaro and Nicolas Duchamp, with whom I worked at Cornell University, and I developed um, uh, this, uh, all this, this, this approach, especially Nicolas Duchamp, who was uh, with me very late um, in, the, in the night for all the samplings um, and for developing the initial idea, actually. 
And Jean-Baptiste Verdi, who has been instrumental in developing all the statistic aspects of this project, without him, there would not be all these models um, implemented. Um, and the tenacious um, time system and you for your attention.